yeah, I just want to get to know more about you, but also for other people to learn more about you. So I guess to start for you, Jarvis, I know I was referring to you as Gerald, but I know most people call you Jarvis. Um, I want to go back even before solo career, before the Philosopher Kings, uh, back to your childhood, because did you grow up in, um, in Jamaica? I did. Um, from, well, not really grew up. I left Jamaica when I was just like eight. So okay. My early, early childhood, but my, uh, was, was in Jamaica. Yeah. Okay. And did you, I read somewhere you attended Bob Marley's one love concert. I did. Yeah. My family, um, my family's Jamaican. Like we've, you know, my family goes back in Jamaica for a long, long time. And, um, my dad actually was the head of the civil service and, um, uh, you know, the, Bob Marley did this really famous one love kind of peace conference uh, concert where he brought um, sort of the two warring political parties, uh, Michael Manley and, and um, Siaga together. And uh, I think that's who it was. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was there when I was really young, when I was seven. So yeah, you said you were young, you're only seven, but do you remember anything from that or did that help shape or shape your career as either a person or as an artist in any way? Yeah, I do remember it. Um, I remember, you know, I, I think the impression that I got from that concert was just the power of music and just how um, music can do very big things. Um, you know, I think that, yeah, I think that, you know, I come from a very sort of academic family and my dad, um, was a university professor and, um, and, uh, there weren't really many, uh, you know, professional, um, uh, entertainers in, in my family. And I remember at that early age thinking that, wow, music is, is important if it's, if it's, you know, getting these important people together. Yeah, absolutely. So did you know at that point in your life or maybe after you moved that you wanted to, to be an artist? Um, that was like in my early teens. I, I used to just go around junior high school singing constantly. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I kind of enjoyed the spotlight and I enjoyed the attention from it and kind of like, uh, I think from an early age, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but the first thing was I wanted to be on stage. And then I think it was like, okay, I can sing. That's how I can get on stage. And I just sort of, you know, st tried to stay on stage as much as possible. <laughs> What about, uh, cause I read you were also a pretty good football player at uh, AY Jackson. You won a championship. Yeah, I was for, you know, for high school. Um, but yeah, <laughs> football was a, a real uh, passion of mine and I was, I was pretty good at it. I was like the, um, the youngest starting player on the team, um, on that senior team that, uh, cause we only had one team and it was a senior team and usually like, uh, you know, grade nine and grade 10 didn't get to really start, but I was a starter by the time I was grade 10. So, um, yeah, I was pretty good at it. But again, and the, you knew that music was probably the ultimate destination, right? Yeah. I it just, I just kind of, you know, I just started doing it at a really young age. And, um, and then when I was 21, the philosopher Kings, we got signed to a major label, you know, deal with Sony Canada. And that was sort of like, okay, the first time I really thought I was going to maybe pursue this as a career. Mm -hmm. So speaking of the philosopher Kings, obviously a lot of people know you from that. Um, and you mentioned how you took philosophy in school and you chose the philosophy, the name, the philosopher Kings because of the allegory of the cave from Plato. I don't know anything about philosophy. All that stuff goes way over my head. Um, can you just talk about why that specific name or why that stood out to you? Why the Philosopher Kings? Um, well, the idea, Plato's idea, was that the best kings would be philosophers. So that's really the premise. It's just uh, philosophers should be the leaders. Um, and I think it was just sort of, you know, when we were starting out, we certainly had a lot of you know, bravado and, and uh, attitude. And we used to like to sort of, um, you know, be kind of cocky and, and sort of uh, play at, at things that were sort of exaggerated. That was sort of something that we, 
we just felt like that was lacking in Canada. You know, Canadian musicians are so humble and they're so like understated and they're so like regular, regular people. We're just, you know, so we kind of wanted to buck against that. And I think that's sort of one of the themes of, of our, of our band was that we were, we were always trying to be, um, you know, uh, just over the top. <laughs> Interesting. That kind of reminds me, I kind of, I don't want to say I compare it to, but I remember after Donovan Bailey won, you know, one of those famous races, 100 meter people, he was kind of criticized for, you know, being so over the top. Right. And to you, and just you mentioning that, um, did you ever kind of get any pushback from the media or anyone in the business because of that, because of your attitude? Um, <laughs> I know Donovan Bailey. Okay. Uh, and uh, we, we have a, a nickname for him. We call him Prima Donovan because <laughs> he was very much uh on and off the track just uh, a very confident person and he was the fastest man in the world and you know he carried himself that way um so uh yeah i don't know it's just you know it, it was it was just more of a it was more of a like a, a character we were playing it's not we don't really think we're better than anybody else it was just uh we just felt that that kind of um uh bravado was kind of lacking in canada at the time yeah no and i agree and i think you could argue it still does i think we're still known as being very humble and yeah and quiet, but we need to remind ourselves uh no, no like we're extremely talented and we need to own that and one kind of going off that you you had a quote uh, you were being interviewed at a radio station and i think it still fits to this day where you said their own country canada doesn't recognize um their art uh, until they get that affirmation from the u.s um do you i mean do you still believe that is true to this day yeah i, th I think it's true but i don't I, I don't blame canadians for that um because it's not it's just a different level. So, so that's really what it is. It's like, you can love a band and they're, they're great. But once America loves them, that usually means the rest of the world loves them as well. So they really go, you know, it's just a progression of, of like, like we would love Drake and Justin Bieber just as much, but the fact that they're international superstars makes us love them even more, I think. Yeah, no. I I completely agree. And also, to be honest, part of my mission with my my content, my social media is, again, to remind people, you know, that we have a, all these extremely talented artists um, in this small little country, um, and it's continuously growing. Um, I do want to get off, obviously, into your music a bit. So, of course, we start off in 94 with your uh, self-titled album, um, with the big song Charms coming off of that um, album. But then, of course, the next one... Um, Famous, Rich, and Beautiful, that one really, I think, propelled you guys. Um, it's funny, I'll be honest, I didn't know up until recently that Cry was a cover. I mean, right. I'm born in 87, I've heard music, but like, I, I don't know every sample that exists. So I'm always curious, um, first of all, that was Cry to me is my favorite. Actually, I should say Cry and Castles in the Sand, I, I, my two favorite. Um, but I'm always curious when it comes to artists sampling other artists or covering other artists, why they chose that certain song or did they have a vision so why or how did you select cry um well we like we like to flip songs that's sort of when we do a cover we want to flip it somehow mm -hmm. um and uh just our you know it was just the right time like doing a cover is all about timing uh the song has to just be a certain age and just um you know, so it was just, a, it was a great choice. Uh, and then our version of it was real, was just fire. So it really, you know, it just really sealed the deal because we just really had that, that groove and just the vibe. And um, uh, I, I still perform that song uh, today and the crowd just absolutely loves it. It's definitely a high point of my show. Yeah, like I said, it's incredible. I think it still hits to this day, which is really telling um, that it could last for up until now and to, it'll continue to last. By the way, I saw you did a show in the, at, was it the Marriott in Muskoka a week ago? Yeah, JW Marriott in, in Muskoka. Well, I'm just curious, what was that for? Um, do you know Mike Holmes? Yes. Yeah, he was launching a wine and he threw a party and he hired me to come play his party. And it was it was really, really fun my first time up there pretty sweet yeah no i did a, i did an event I, I do events for a company so i went there and it's a drive from here but it's 
it's stunning. It's yeah. beautiful. So it's beautiful. It's awesome. Uh, again, continuing with famous, rich and beautiful. Of course we had other song hurts to love you. Uh, I am the man. Uh, you don't love me. All great songs off that album. I want to know the story because I read, actually you talked about this in an interview, how you recorded that in Philly and that was hopefully going to break you in the U S but then something happened with one of your band members and a secretary. <laughs> yes. You can know the story. I don't expect you to say the name, but I just want to know about the, the, the back. Yeah. Um, that's exactly it. We went to Philly. We used this specific producer, um, and we were signed to this, uh, American label. Um, and one of our bandmates, <laughs> the lead songwriter, uh, you know, saw the secretary when we walked in there and was real smitten. And, and it's, and it was at the time the secretary's like was, was dating the, you know, the president of the company at the time. And, um, but they like, it was on and off or whatever. Um, and this, so there was this whole heated like confrontation between uh, <laughs> the songwriter and our band, um, and uh, and uh, well, it was John. There you go. I'll tell you, it's not too hard. Piano player John. Um, but there was a whole heated, you know, confrontation, and there was like a you know almost a fight and everything like that. But that girl the secretary was the inspiration for the song hurts to love you which he wrote then right at the studio while that whole thing was going on you know and it really did hurt to love her it cost us an american career um but uh you know it did uh, you know it did make a great make for a great song so maybe it balances out well <laughs> i don't know if it balanced out but you did also mention you know, because of that, and unfortunately, because that happened, and you didn't kind of get, you, you weren't, um, you didn't really, like, I don't want to say you didn't succeed in the U.S., but, yeah. you know, you didn't become that, a household that album didn't get released. That was our biggest album with Cry and Hurts to Love yeah. You and You Don't Love Me, and um, and that album never got released in America. So it, it yeah. really did, uh, you know, kind of stunt us right, uh, right at our at our moment. Yeah, but you do mention again in another interview where I guess that kind of forced you guys to kind of really hustle. Um, and for you, for for instance, you know, you and uh, and Brian with track and field, you were producing and songwriting with other artists. Um, so I think it kind of that helped um, sure. or kind of helped, you know, pr push you and, and everyone else and also James as well, of course. Um, I do want to, of course, talk about for those who don't know that you, of course, worked with Nelly. Nelly Furtado. Um, uh, I do want to go back to that date because I know the date is June 8th, 1997 at the Honey Jam uh, Showcase. I was told, or again, from what I read, it wasn't just you guys that kind of discovered her, but it was an intern at BMG named Rose or something. Does that make sense? There was an um, intern at BMG named Rose. Um, I don't know, like, um, maybe she suggested that we go to the Honey Jam or something like that. I don't, uh, but it, I mean, it was me that approached Nelly and said, hey, let's make music. And we started in the studio and we kind of, you know, and then I brought in Brian and then I brought in my manager at the time, Chris Smith. So uh, it's fair to say that I discovered her. Yeah. Was there anything, I mean, everyone just talks about, I don't know, was it her voice that was unique? Was there something yeah. to you? You know, to her. Her, her sincerity, you know, uh, I'm that type of singer that, you know, singing is like acting in a way. It has to be believable. You know, you have to be um, like you can't picture the person just as an actor and the great, great actors. You can't even believe that they're acting. You just see the character. And I think singing is like that as well. And I think Nelly has that ability to just portray the character in the song and you don't uh, you know she can sell she can sell it and she she was just a, a real child of pop music too so she had that um love of pop, pop music which is so rare with excuse me with young artists it's like they hate pop, pop usually and they always want to do obscure indie music and and getting them to like try to make songs that are like the big songs on the radio is usually a challenge so she was 
always that way. And she just had a really eclectic taste and a really, and she was an amazing songwriter, amazing, you know, lyricist and, and, um, and just, you know, you have to have a certain kind of like naive innocence to make great music, I believe. And, and she just had that. And um, so did Brian and I, and the three of us just really meshed and we really just kind of, you know, made some great stuff. 100%. Also, I do have to say, I appreciate the fact because obviously people and people love that she's making this big comeback and everything. Um, but I do appreciate the fact that you can also be critical of these people. And you are you were a bit critical of her um, because I know you mentioned about, you know, her first two, or I guess, going from her first album, Woe Nelly to Folklore. And then I guess beyond that. And I guess maybe I'm curious what you were thinking back then or even now where you said you felt like maybe she was thinking more for herself and not for the fans. Correct me if I'm wrong. And so, yeah, I don't know. Do you mind? Do you want to talk about that, or if you don't want? I don't mind talking about that. Um, you know, it's just it's like this. It's like you create this world for the fans, and they absolutely love it. And then the next thing you do is like the opposite, and then the next thing you do is the opposite of that, and then the next thing you do is the opposite of that. It's just it's just like you know, like it, it's you know, artists. A big challenge is is sort of. You know, we have big egos. That's why we're artists, right? Um, but the ego is what says, oh, you think I, I can only do this one thing? Well, now I'm going to do something completely different. Now that I'm going to be great, you know. And I always think of an artist like Sade, who just created something and then just stayed there. Or Taylor Swift is another great example. For, for 10 years, in fact, her whole career, it's just been this very coherent you know, journey where it's just, this is my music, this is my world, this is my identity. And sure, it changes, but it's not like, now I'm going to do a hip-hop album, now I'm going to do a rock album. Now, you know, it's just, and I just think that um, Nelly had had a lot of that, because I don't think she was comfortable with her her success, really, the, the hugeness of it. And it's a hard, you know, it's a burden. It's, it's a hard, it's a heavy weight to carry. Um... And so, so that's kind of like my thought on that. But, uh, you know, I, I think she's super talented. And, um, but it just felt like she was trying to show everybody that she can do everything. Yeah, no, I, again, I respect that opinion. I, I do agree with that. Um, speaking of other artists that you worked with, of course, was a, I don't know, either say Kanon or Kanaan. It's Kanon, I guess. Like, Kanon. Yeah, Kanon. Um, so uh, first, again, going back to Nelly, we won a Grammy, or she won a Grammy. Did you win a Grammy with her for that 2002 no. Grammy? You get I okay. Didn't. You don't. No, I was um, the producer of the year in in uh, 2002. For uh, Brian and I were nominated for producer of the year for Wo Nelly, but we didn't win. Yeah, but of course, fast forward 22 years, you win a Grammy, or I guess I say it was 20, it was 2024, but I guess the song was written came out in 2023. Right. Yes. So with Kanon uh, for Refugee for uh, Best Song for Social Change, um, which I think is a great story because, again, you started working with him when he first started back in the early 2000s. And, I mean, did you, I mean, I could ask, did you see that he was going to be successful? Like, I don't know if that's a dumb question, but did you ever think that you would get to this point where you want a Grammy with him? I mean, this Grammy could not have been further off any of our radar. I mean, we, we didn't actually nominate the song. Somebody else nominated it. It's a new cat, like, like just the, the, in this category of fans can nominate the song. So it's not like you submit it or, or you know, so, uh, and, and this category is only two years old. So we'd never heard of it before. Um, so it was the furthest thing from our mind. But in terms of, did I think I would, was going to make great music with Kanon? The answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, it's hard not to. He's he's just really, he's kind of like a generational artist. He is just such an incredible, powerful poet and, and lyricist and MC. And, um, you know, in a world where nobody has anything to say and, and the challenge is what am I going to talk about? He's got so much to say and so much to talk about. Um, so, you know, and I've been doing a lot of work, um, you know, but it's just, they're usually with, they're been, you know, usually with new artists, you know, I'm developing new artists and we're, we're helping them find that sound and we're sort of developing them. But 
to work with an established artist and then an artist that you're like a huge fan of, as I am uh, with Kanon, um, was just, uh, you know, it, it, was a, it was a treat from the beginning. Uh, and we're still, we're still writing now. We're still uh, making new songs for his upcoming album that, that uh, Refugee's going to be on. I was going to say, yeah, do you know when that album is going to come out? Uh, I do not actually no, but I mean, you know, we're trying to, we're think, we're, you know, we're like planning to release it now. So it will probably be, you know, like maybe the fall or something, or where are we in now? We're in summer. Yeah. Maybe the fall. Okay. Uh, going back a bit again. So after famous, rich and beautiful, you guys take a break about nine or 10 years. You do, there was a quote of you talking about being burnt out. Um, was that, I guess, right after uh, the second album or just from touring? Like, what, what was going through your head at that point? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it was just being bur burnt out from being in a band. Uh, being, a ba being in a band, it's, it's easy when you're young. As you get older, it gets harder. <laughs> you know? Um, so I think that was it, yeah. Um, it's just, you know, I was still producing and still writing and still doing my solo stuff but um yeah just the band stuff was was getting more and more challenging okay that's fair so i guess before you guys did your comeback in 2006 with castles you started your solo career in 2002 um with shake it off that was your first uh, solo album uh of course the lead single shake it off which i really liked you also had timeline with nelly on it mm -hmm. i really like fear life with is it pronounced estero yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I also love the connection because apparently she was an inspiration for Nelly. Yeah. For, for Nelly back in the where did, I, I've, I've heard of her a bit, but can you talk? What, what's yeah. Astero? Like, what's her situation? Astero um, uh, and uh, a producer named Doc uh, got, got together um, in the early, mid 90s, maybe, or late 90s, and made just this classic, incredible. Um, album Astero is is one of the greatest singers of all time. Like if you you gotta go like just like an Amy Winehouse type of voice. Um, uh, so everybody that was anybody uh, you know knew about her and was a fan of hers. Uh, and and she found a great producer in Doc, and and they went on to make some some great great music together. Awesome. Yeah. No, I, I was looking more into her music, and I guess she's still. She's still doing stuff in the music scene, I guess. Um, but uh, I don't know what. Uh, is, do you know? Is she in Toronto? Do you know where she is? I don't. I, I don't know where she is. Um, uh, yeah, she's a. She, <laughs> so. I'm curious. Uh, when I look at artists, and especially on their streams, their numbers online uh, on Spotify, um, I'm always wondering like why certain songs are more popular than others. And for you, what I find interesting is that for your solo career, it's you have "Shake It Off." But then your most popular, according to at least Spotify, looks like is Shake It Off, the reggae remix. Mm -hmm. um, any idea, in your opinion, why that is? Does that make you happier or not? No, it, it makes me happy um, because reggae is universal. And I, I you know, the, the, that, that, that recording had some of the best players uh, in the world. Um, you know, uh, one of the guitarists... Um, uh, BZ, I think his name was, you know, played with Bob Marley and uh, uh, Courtney, a really uh, talented uh, Jamaican artist. Um, John uh, John Courtney uh, helped me produce it, and um, it's just timeless. I listen to it now. It's it's one of my favorite things that I've ever done. Uh, yeah, I absolutely love it. Can I ask you what's more? In your opinion, what's more difficult, uh, working performing as a solo artist or in a band? Uh, you know, they have their their strengths. Um, you know, like I said, you know, it was when you're young, it was it's great being in a band. When you get a little older, you kind of just outgrow all the band stuff. <laughs> you know that that band stuff doesn't go away. It, it, it's, it, it's like, you know, it could be like we got together in 2016 to make a one last album and there was more band stuff than ever. Uh, you know, we're all in our 50s. So it just, um, it doesn't go away, you know. So <laughs> that's the thing. And it just gets tiring, 
you know so you want to you want to you know as and also i think when you're younger you don't have a clear vision of the music in your head you're just it's easier to be part of a collective but now i mean 30 years i've been doing this when i go to make a song now it's not really a journey of experimentation it's like i have a song in my head and then i want to make it I have a style in my head. I have something I want to do, and I want to make it. I don't want to just sort of experiment where I don't know where I'm going to end up. And that's sort of what it was like with the Philosopher Kings. You, you do, speaking of that, because I believe you mentioned again when you were younger, like you said, you preferred to maybe come up with more maybe original songs versus now you prefer, I don't know if you want to say more cover or sampling. I don't know if that's something you want to talk about or yeah. that's, if I'm wrong at all. Um, I think that I like to create bigger blocks. You know, like w when I was starting off, I could spend a lot of time just creating a beat, you know? Now I want to just find a beat and use that beat. You know what I mean? I'm going to find a beat. I'm importing that exact beat. And then it even extrapolates it's like a style of song. Okay, I just want to find a style of song like this. And I have an idea for the chorus, and then we'll kind of take it from there. So it's just, I'm like working with uh, big, bigger building blocks now. Um, you know, I like, to, I like to have a track and then start writing to a finished track. You know what I mean? As opposed to just yeah. starting with a groove, and then the bass player does something, and then the guitarist does something, and then, you know, like, it's more like, let's just, um, yeah, bigger blocks. So then speaking of that, that, was it easier to do the whole soul station stuff because you had these established songs or was that how did, did that, that did that have its own set of challenges well, that was see that the soul station stuff was about live and when it comes to live there's nothing better than a cover i mean you're like you know like what i what my my, my show really was just a show full of hits there were no sort of like album tracks on it. And what's great now is that through the Philosopher Kings uh, and some Jarvis Church songs, you know, I have about five or six hits that everybody knows that are my own originals um, and the Philosopher King originals. So I just wanted to sort of pepper the rest of the set with covers. So I didn't want to have any sort of new music for the audience to be digesting, you know, live. Um, I just, um, oh, somebody's saying the Philosopher King album was the <laughs> best, the live album. Yeah, that live album was dope. Um, but that's really, you know, for me, it's always centered around a live show. And, um, yeah, so that's why I have these themes, like I'm going to do Sam Cooke, or I'm going to do uh, Bill Withers, and then I, you know, do a bunch of Bill Withers covers, um, and then I'll do, like, some originals that are in that vein, and then I'll just hit him with the Philosopher King hits and some Jarvis Church hits and just, you know, go out with a show where everybody basically knows all the songs. I have to say, by, by the way, um, I don't know who is in charge of, like, promoting the Soul Station stuff back then, but I love how you guys are, like, walking the streets of Toronto on the subway. Was that your idea, by the way, at all? Or yeah, yeah. There was a director, actually, that wanted to do a little short, but, yeah, that, he, he had that idea, and uh, that was a lot of fun. And that's when I um, really, you know, met my partner in crime, Wade Brown, who I still perform with to this day. He's just such a, you know, he's a Toronto legend. Everybody knows Wade, Wado. He goes by Wado Brown, but uh, um, he performs with me now most times. And uh, our, our last show was just the two of us um, singing the tracks. And we, you know, we can put on... Uh, a full show the two of us just because you know we both can can do some heavy lifting and uh it, it's a really it's a really good time i gotta give a shout out to wade it's great i'm great grateful to have him in my corner who uh unfortunately i, I don't know i've never heard of him but who has he worked with or how long what has he done in the past he, he is like a, kind of a local music, musician that plays around toronto he had a couple of back in the day um but like he's he played with drake he played you know he's played with all the huge superstars but um he's kind of like maybe one of toronto's greatest sort of you know live 
showman and and he you know so people kind of know him uh they you know whether they've seen him you know at a variety of different places around toronto speaking of people well, um, I did actually something that you just reminded me of. I'm curious, and I was asked artists like, who they'd like to collab with. Um, I don't know if you ever did collab with this person or this group. I don't know. I don't think you did, but uh, Jack Soul and Hayden Neal, of course, who's no longer with us. Was that ever a possibility, or did you ever want to work well, with Well, we, we did shows together. Um, um, yeah, and we were they, were they were a band that was sort of similar to our style, for sure. Um, uh, John Levine uh, collaborated with Hayden. They did some songwriting together. I think so did James. Uh, yeah, Jellystone. Somebody's given mm -hmm. props to Jellystone. Another yeah. like kind of underground Toronto legend, you know, from back in the day. Just uh, amazing, amazing uh, rapper. So Jellystone. So. I went to, I don't know if you heard, remember that Drake concert, it was a few summers ago where he had that all-star, all whatever, Canadian tour, okay. where he invited all these old-school like R&B and hip-hop guys from Canada. I got to go, that's when kind of Nelly kind of made her official comeback. Um, Jellystone was there, um, it's too bad you weren't there, I don't know if you heard about that, but you should have been there, just saying. So. Sure, it would have been great. It would have been great. Um, I do want to bring up a story randomly because one person who I've talked to and I've kept a relationship with is Simone Denny, if that rings a bell, from no. Love Inc. So Love Inc., it was a band in the late 90s that You're a Superstar was their big hit. She said she was at somewhere at Much Music and backstage someone either in your band or yourself didn't think that she was singing live and then she proved it to you. Does that ring a bell or not at all? I don't think it was me, <laughs> uh, but I, I know. Uh, I remember them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, she was a heavy, heavy singer. I just wanted to bring that up. I was just curious. It's all good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I guess the question is: besides, you know, working with with uh, with Kanon and other artists, um, what about your plans for uh, for the? Are you going to do another album or or just singles? Huh. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't really have any plans to do a new album, um, but I you know I'll kind of get. Uh, around to I'm I'm like I'm doing a new show like like I'm doing a new new tour that's kind of what I've been working on um, I'm gonna be in Niagara Falls on April 8th for that uh, solar eclipse have you heard about this no. on April there's gonna be a, a solar eclipse in Niagara Falls the whole place is gonna go black for four minutes like in the middle of the day complete darkness uh, over the falls so it's kind of a combination of a, you know, solar eclipse and a, you know, one of the world's, you know, great natural landmarks. So it's going to be uh, a lot of people are going to Niagara Falls for the eighth. So I'm going to be going up there to do a show. But yeah, I'm kind of, uh, and I think a Canada Day show as well in Barrie. Um, I just, yeah, I'm just doing shows and, um, you know, working with Canon still. <laughs> that's that's great. And we're with whoever else wants to work with me. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you, I mean, either before and when you were younger or now, would you say you prefer singing over producing or you prefer both of them equally? Like they're completely different, obviously. Yeah. But is there one you. Um, I love singing. That's probably my first love for okay. sure. Okay. Who else? I mean, if you just remind me and everyone else quickly, like with you and Brian with track and field, uh, just a few of the artists, I guess. So there was Nelly, there was Kanon. Was there any other artists that I'm missing out? Uh huh. Yeah, Stacy Arico. Um, uh, you can sing with her as well. Uh huh. Yeah, exactly. We did a song together as well. Um, uh, uh, Stacy Arico. We did a couple of hits. I forget the names of them, but yeah, we did. Um, we, we you know we did a we we kind of worked with a lot of people but the songs never really came out like we we did some stuff with Ricky Martin we did some stuff with Tina Turner we did some stuff uh, you know like just you know a couple songs but maybe they didn't get cut or they didn't get released on the album or something like that. Mm -hmm. By the way, just randomly, have you seen the that Netflix documentary, The Greatest Night in Pop? No, no, I haven't. I, you should. It's about so with the We Are the World song that they created and just the story behind that and how they, all these stars came together. It's highly recommended. So. Okay.
Sure. sure. Um, another great artist I worked with is named uh, Zach Oliver. Um, and also Jordan Alexander. Do you know who that is? The girl from the, the Gossip Girl reboot. She's a Canadian singer. And now, and now she's a Canadian actor. Uh, but uh, she was the lead in, in Gossip Girl 2. Um, okay. Seasons. But we worked together. We did a whole album together. Um, I'm trying to think who else. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm curious, I guess maybe one last question, because through interviewing other people, I've discovered there's think, so many ridiculous connections in the industry. Like one, for example, the fact that Nelly, she won, I guess you guys, for best producer for a Juno. I guess you were a part of that, right? Back in 2002? Yeah. I think she won you know, for, I guess it was I'm Like a Bird and uh, Turn Off the Lights, I think. Yeah. And one of the people she beat was James and Jay Levine because they were working with B44. Oh. Which I think is so fun because obviously they were in Philosopher Kings with you guys. Are there any other like weird connections that you could tell me that like either just working with other people that or that things that no one has any clue that you worked with this group or something like that? Um, um, I mean, the, 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 the degrees of separation, you know, from the Philosopher Kings reached like <laughs> so many. I mean, it's a list, you know. Yeah. Pages and pages and pages. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, I can't, I can't really think of it. <laughs> but but they're, 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 def they're definitely out there for sure. Yeah. So you're, uh, you live in L.A. now, uh, right? No. I'm in Miami. I'm in Miami now. Oh, okay. Oh, because you're on the same time. So that's why I was like, yeah, like Pacific, but never mind. Yeah. We're good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, that's awesome. But uh, when did, how long, when did you move from Toronto? Oh, from Toronto in 2000. I, I was in L.A. for 23 years. I just moved to Miami uh, last year. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, awesome. been a long, like long time, and I'm just loving the newness of it all. I just I love being in a new place, and new city. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, no, again, thank you uh, for everything. And of course, uh, I'll, uh, I'll post part of these interviews online. And um, just thank you again for everything that you contributed um, to the music scene. And I uh, just wish you all the best and everything else. Well, I appreciate it very much, John. Thank you.